so we're going we're gonna to cover you know, branding and design, um, how to extend that uh, to your community, engage more deeply with your influencers. Uh, make sure you've got a channel strategy uh, that's in line with what you're trying to accomplish, and then cover some on measurement. Uh, I'm going to start with design. And now design is tricky. People think of design as, you know, what's, what's, the, what's my logo look like? And what are the colors I'm being used? But design is really about you're designing something new. You're, des you're creating some new product or service. And how you design that is really important. I try to use this sometimes, this little experiment. Uh, you're driving down the road, you know, let's pretend you have an interest in some breakfast. Which, uh, which, which, which sign are you going to respond best to? So a show of hands for, for this. It's pretty good. Pretty good, the majority. Smaller, smaller group. Why is that? Why did, so, why did you choose the, 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 this one here? Authentic. Authentic. Authenticity. Why this one? Anybody? Appear. Say it again? Appear. Clear. So now you're driving down the street and you, <laughs> you have an interest. Uh, which, which of these? Let's get a show of hands for this one. All right. We got a couple. A couple of... Uh, and this one, why, why, why would you choose this one over the other? Looks more legit. Looks more legit. Okay, that's it's stimulus response and it's designing its purposeful approach to attracting your audience. And when you're creating and designing your startup, you really want to be sure that you're designing for the audience that you want to attract. Uh, most people think of branding and. They think, oh, well, what's my logo going to look like? And what's the front page of my website going to look like? And it's so much more than that, that when you think of your logo and the design of your site or your app, think of it as an empty vessel that's being filled with meaning with every experience and every interaction that you have with the people you're trying to influence. That extends beyond your logo. It extends to the experience that you're creating. Uh, creating an experience for your investors, for your partners, um, and for your, your employees is very important. And that's about defining behaviors. That's about being very purposeful in the way you're creating an experience, whether it's an app or the experience someone has when they go to your website. Kenny, I thought, had some great examples of websites, you know, the, that colorful one with all that information. It's more than just provide, they're trying to provide some information, but they're also, they're designing what that experience is like, and that was like overload. So you're probably gonna exit very quickly. Um, it's also about creating behaviors, the way you behave, the way you speak to your investors or your customers, the way you impart knowledge to your employees. Defining those things is incredibly important. Uh, Apple's become a bit of a cliche in this regard. Uh, I talk to clients all the time and ask them, well, so what kind of brand do you think you'd like to be like? And they always say Apple, uh, or they say Google. Well, I guarantee you when 19, in 1998 when Google was founded, and, and aside from some mathematicians who understand the word, the logo, the Google logo meant nothing until people began to have experiences with it. And those compounded experiences never end. So you're constantly having to reinforce what it is you're about. Believe me, everything about the Apple experience is designed for you to have a simple experience that allows you to become a brand ad advocate uh, and that's memorable. The experiences you create need to be delivered consistently. Uh, Starbucks has done a fantastic job of training its employees to give you a consistent experience wherever you are whether you're in Seattle or whether you're in Boston or whether you're in uh, the UK. The, the fact, the hospitality industry is also fantastic about this. They define the experience. If you walk into an aloft hotel in, uh, in San Diego or one in Boston, you're gonna have similar upholstery, similar design and feel of the entry area, and the people are going to behave very, very consistently. That consistency builds comfort. It reinforces the feeling that you have. And whether you're, whether you're dividing, uh, creating a new startup that's a, an app and you think you're never going to actually speak to a customer, 
the way you design that and the experience you create and how consistently you deliver that experience is very important to building comfort. When you build comfort for people, you build a community. And when you do it, when you design your startup, when you design your, the experiences that you're creating for people and your customers and all the people in your, uh, all the influencers in your network, uh, including your investors and your employees, you design that experience purposefully, you define those behaviors, and you deliver them consistently, you build a community of brand ambassadors that can really be unstoppable because those people are going to extend that brand when they talk to their friends, when they talk to other colleagues, when they bump into someone they haven't seen in a long while and they speak about you, your company, and the manner in which you behave consistently. They're, they're brand ambassadors that can really make you unstoppable. And reinforcing that all the time is very important. Chuck's going to pick up on that uh, and extend that quite a bit into PR and messaging and building uh, repeatable messages. Great. Um, so I'll go, oh, good, this is working. So once you um, have that brand, and excuse me, my notes are here, so I might be walking forward a bit so I can make sure I don't miss anything. But once you have that a community, you want to start extending it. And um, being on the PR side, I, I've spoken to a number of startup founders, and they, they, they always think, you know, I need PR. How many people said, we need PR, right? We know we need it. Uh, show of hands, if you have a startup, if you said, I need PR, I need to get out there. And usually, you know, people define PR as I just need to get in front of the media, right? That's usually how that, that thing. PR is a lot more than that. And uh, what I wanted to do is go through some myths about what people think they need versus what is actually happening in the market and that sort of thing. So... Um, the first myth of the startup is that if you just build a better mousetrap, the world's going to be a path to your door. And, you know, that's certainly part of it. That's definitely necessary. You need to have that better mousetrap. You need to have that, that better technology. Um, people need to know about it. And, but most, most importantly, um, the PR and branding and all those other pieces go to not just, uh, you know, what it is, but the UX, the design, the understanding of the speaking directly to customers, um, all those pieces are together and, and building that community around what that is that you're really trying to, to, to do well. There's the great myth of the VHS versus Betamax. Everybody says VHS won because of branding and Betamax lost. But Betamax didn't lose. Um, Betamax had a very strong community among the, uh, among the B2B world. They were very big in TV. And it was only a couple of years ago that Beta finally stopped producing its last tape long after digital took over. Because it had built, it focused its community pretty tightly as opposed to trying to go broad uh, and saying, forget the home market, we're going to focus on the, uh, the professional market. So that was a really about product market fit, but also about building that community and building a tight community. Um, another myth that I, that I hear all the time, I'm going to get the media, and then I'll find the customers and community later. Um, it's actually that works exactly the opposite. The reality is that you got to think about your community from day one. The, the day you're starting, the day you're getting out, your community is everybody. Uh, it's customers, it's partners, it's investors, it's friends, it's family, it's competitors. Those are all part of your community. You, you want to basically keep them all close. You want to keep them tight. And you, you want to think about not just the big things in that community, but the simple things, your email newsletters, uh, your holiday cards, you, you know, the way you interact with them one-on-one -on -one when they call into your office, how the phone is answered, what the website is. All that is about uh, that community. But most importantly, you want to not just take from that community, you want to give back. You want to be part of it. And this is where the competitor side comes in, where you want to really be part of that community and not just say, hey, you know, we're better than you guys. But how do you give back? How do you work together? How do you hold conferences that bring the people in? How do you uh, put out blog posts or articles or other things that give back to that community and help grow it and make you a trusted part of that community? Um, this is a big one, uh, the, the myth. Community is only about social media. If you spend all of your time on Facebook and on Twitter and on LinkedIn and say, I did my community relations, yay, you're wasting your time. <laughs> it's, it's, that's only a piece of it. That's only part of it. It's certainly useful. It is a very important part. I don't want to dismiss it, but it's not all community relations. Community relations is much bigger than that. At the same time, it's important. Uh, a lot of companies I know say, hey, I hired a college intern and they're just going to handle my social for me also the wrong way to go because you're handing off your community relations to somebody who's not really part of your community, not invested in it in the way you are. You need to think about that as part of the overall marketing mix. Where does it fit in and how do you use it to really drive forward? Um, 
Now that you have the community, and now that you're thinking about the community, it's in your brain and you're, you're going that direction, you need to think about how do you engage it? What content is it that you do to do out, outbound and inbound uh, marketing that's really gonna help engage those influencers? This is starts where media relations begins to come into play, uh, and some of the stuff that's traditionally thought about as PR. Um, you know, we, we mentioned, it was mentioned earlier about, you know, if you have some PR, put it up there, or what is your validator uh, that's gonna be out there? If you're an unknown, it's hard to, uh, to really trust you. The PR does act as a validator for that. Um, so you need to certainly think about it. How many people have thought this? If I just had that one article in the New York Times, we're gonna get those, those customers, right? How many people had that thought? Yeah, I, or, or it used to be, I need to be on Oprah. If I was on Oprah, everybody, yeah, everybody's gonna show up. I actually know companies that have almost gone out of business from being on Oprah. Um, it, they couldn't service their current customers, it really blew them out of the water. However, um, it's a pretty big bar to say, yeah, I'm gonna have the New York Times and that's gonna be it. What Really what you wanna be able to do in a media relations program is not just aim for that one article in the New York Times, but create a sustained program that's gonna be ongoing, that's gonna keep that story alive, that's gonna keep pieces out there. Um, the New York Times might be great, it might, you might get lucky, you might hit it, but you know what? This work, worry about the program and your community, where your community really is, and what are they really reading and what's engaging them. Do you have a question? Yeah, so sometimes a web article in New York Times can ruin your business. It can, it really can. The New York Times article can ruin your business, not just negative press either. And a quick story on the Oprah thing, there was a company out in the Western Massachusetts made uh, little, little bags, reusable bags for kids to put snacks in to go to school. And she told me that uh, she was on Oprah one day, her piece was on the table, and Oprah literally picked it up and put it down. That's all Oprah did. And the calls came in like crazy. And she was trying to service all these calls. She did not have the, the, the manufacturing infrastructure to keep up. She was so busy servicing those calls, she almost lost all of her current customers who were out there that she was starting to walk away from. And she had to think about her community and really where her business was gonna sustain and almost ignore those calls coming in because they were just too much. And that's where that, you know, that media release, you gotta be ready for it. You have to be prepared before you start doing that media outreach and what is really gonna work. Um, I spoke with a company recently, uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna name them, they were about to start a Kickstarter campaign and they wanted to do it coming out of the CES show. And he says, look, I did the, I did the research and I know that if I get an article, I'm gonna get 1,000 emails and I only need 10,000 emails, and then I got a Kickstarter campaign. I'm good, right? So I just need 10 articles, and I'll get that, and it'll be great. I said, well, really, how are you gonna do that? He goes, I, I call him up, it'll be good. Well, I have a list, I'm good. Um, never saw one article from him. His Kickstarter still hasn't launched. He had a good experience at CES, but that plan of I'm gonna get the emails from the media doesn't always work that way. And he had to start thinking about a little bit more, what is the community he's trying to reach and how do I develop that community? Because it's really gonna be what drives it, not the, not the, the articles. Um, this is one I hear a lot. I'm just gonna find a PR person that's got great contacts and they can whisper in the ear of the journalist and the articles are gonna roll in, right? That's, that's a, I, this guy knows everybody. Um, I've been in PR a long time. Most of my contacts have cycled out of the PR world or in the journalism world and into other jobs. Those contacts are now dead. Um, that's not where we focus ourselves. What, what I, the reality is, is find somebody who can tell your story, who can take your value proposition and start turning it into stories that can speak to the media, that can speak to your customers, that can speak to your community. And that will start to drive a more consistent program. The journalists you can find, there are lists, you can call them up. If you've got a good story to tell them, they will listen but certainly start with the community first. Who, and this goes back to that customer listening programs. How do you listen to those customers? How do you take those stories and turn them back around? It's all part of that community relations. Um, reporters are just gonna find your story. That's a myth, I've heard that before. Uh, you know, hey, if, I, if I'm just here, they'll find me. It's actually not entirely false, it's kind of true, but what we, when we, we think about a PR program, what we try to do is lay the breadcrumbs that the reporters can follow to bring them back to us. And that goes back to the community relations. Where are you putting that stuff out? And where are the reporters reading? And thinking about the reporters as part of your community, where they're really who you want to engage. How are you engaging them? What are they reading? What are their sources? How do you surround them? Uh, in, the tech, in, the, in the old um, B2B technology world, analysts were a big part of that. So we began analyst relations programs that began to speak to reporters. Now you kind of go into some of the forums and so on and you're, you're busy there. Or you, um, if, you know, if, speaking of locally, if, uh, how many people here read Scott Kirshner's column every Sunday, right? And, and you know, anyone else reads his column? He's got the innovation economy column. Um, but if, or even, okay, what, what publication is everybody reading? What's a good publication somebody wants to, is thinking about? TechCrunch, VentureBeat, right? You're nodding. 
So if you, if you kind of go through those and you start reading who they're quoting, you'll find there are certain VCs they follow, right? And those are the people they're listening to. How do you engage those people to drive that media? So it's a longer term prospect and they keep coming back to you. Um, you know, you, 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 but the, the fact is reporters want to feel like they found those stories and you can't just call them up and expect them to take it, but they also need that validation. They want to feel like they find it. So you need that, those, that material out there. Um, this one is, is uh, one of the saddest ones I've got. Um, reporters do all their own writing. Uh, I would love to tell you that this is true. Uh, I went to journalism school. I've got a journalism background. I've got a lot of great friends who are journalists. And at the very high level, yes, the New York Times writers and all those other big top level writers, they're all doing their own writing. What's starting to happen elsewhere is you're seeing pieces of blog posts and press releases and so on getting put into articles. So you need to make sure that your stuff is clean as you're writing it. Um, but also, you're, you're finding that if you go to a tech, a tech publication, they'll say to you, hey, can you guys write that for me? And just, we'll you know, put your name on it and do it. And that becomes part of your branding. And you have to be ready to be able to accomplish that. And again, when you're talking about community in that regard, you're speaking to your community through those, through those forums. So as you're kind of getting out there, how do you deliver your message through that community and how do you drive that and bring that back so you can start to use that and then put that back out to the community so that they can all kind of circle around and bring it all together. Um, I love this one. I can measure everything in Google Analytics. Eh, you can measure a lot. You can't measure everything. Uh, I, I've, had, I've had clients say to me, I, can, you know, I will know if the program's working because my Google Analytics will show me. The Google, Google Analytics shows you your web traffic and that's certainly part of it. What it's not gonna show you is a lot of the other pieces of data that are out there that are floating around that you need to be able to pull in. Uh, you know, your sales teams that are talking to people. What are they hearing? Where are they hearing? Where are the influence, where's the influence coming from there? Google Analytics is great if you can give it the referral code. If you can't, which in a lot of cases you won't be able to, it's not gonna always tell you where that traffic is coming from. So you need to recognize what you're looking at when you're looking at Google Analytics because it's not everything. Um, so don't, don't believe that, you know, it's, you know, it's a be all and end all. I got it, you know, I got it all set. I was on Oprah and I'm on Google Analytics and I got it all set. It's, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. So you have to recognize it going in. Um, this is, the, this is the, the, my last of the myths here, but this one is one that used to come up in PR a lot. Pay for play is junk. Uh, nobody wants pay for play. This has changed a lot recently. Um, if any of you have started to do program, or even started to look through what you're reading, you're starting to see sponsored content come up, you know, native advertising and things like that, uh, webinars, pieces that, that are starting to do different parts of your marketing program. And that beco is becoming more and more trusted. In the past, it was only trusted stuff written by journalists. Now, that shifted. And going back to some of the, some of the questions that came up on the value prop uh, presentation, you know, is this trusted? It's a good question, and, and that's coming up. So you have to think about when you're going out there with a program, where the budget goes and how much do I need to spend? If I want to be in VentureBeat, TechCrunch, IDG, if I want to be in the New York Times, are there ways to do that that aren't necessarily me calling reporters, but can I pay for that? And what does that drive and what does it do? These are all questions you're going to need to ask as you're building these PR programs and your SEO programs, but they all go to that community relations component and kind of speaking to that community. Because in order for, to be able to speak to them, you need to have a channel to do so. And you'll have your own channels, but these are starting to emerge as channels that you need to pay attention to. Um, so Todd, I think you're, you're up next. We Thank you, Chuck. So I wanna pick up on a couple of things that, that you mentioned, Chuck. Um, first, I wanna tackle pay for play. Uh, because I think it's a great illustration of the next topic on the slide here, which is convergence. Um, the barriers between earned media and between paid media, in other words, between, say, the editorial side of, of the house and the publishing side of the house, um, were not too long ago really, really strong, really firm. But thanks to people like Craig Newmark, entrepreneurs who came up with crazy ideas like Craigslist, all of a sudden, everything changed, first in the newspaper industry and then basically everywhere else. Revenue models started failing, and the media world shifted very, very rapidly. Today, pay-for-play isn't really the bad word that it was even two years ago, and the landscape is continuing to shift. It's shifting so rapidly that even the media are struggling to, to keep up. One reporter tried his best to capture some of the current options that are available to us and came up with this. Uh, I'm not sure if you, how well you can see that in the back row. 
Uh, the guy who created this is Felix Salmon. If you follow um, economics, he's a, a pretty well-regarded um, economics reporter. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this particular grid, but I present it to you for your reading enjoyment. Um, basically, you, uh, you're asking two key questions. The first question is, who is the piece of content written by? And the second question is, who it's published by? And depending on your answer, the piece of uh, content qualifies as one of these six possibilities. Your marketing mix should probably um, really include a, something from each of these categories um, as you're, you're moving forward. Uh, but, but hurry up, because even these distinctions are starting to blur. As PR people, for example, Chuck and I in particular delve into content marketing, we delve into uh, blogging, we de delve into, of course, public relations, uh, brand journalism, thought leadership, and even a little bit into native advertising and sponsored content. Um, and we're doing that uh, to continue to be relevant as PR people because uh, the, the world has changed so fast and public relations is just one small component of that. So from the startup perspective, where, where should you start here? Um, well, I would suggest that the bottom row is probably the easiest place to start. You know, start with a little bit of marketing content, maybe do some blogging. I'm curious how many people here are, are blogging, either on their own blog or on uh, Medium or LinkedIn. Anybody? Okay, a few people. And, and what platforms are you using, if I can ask? Uh, my blog is on WordPress. WordPress? WordPress. Any Medium people? Any LinkedIn people? LinkedIn as well. Okay, good. Good. So um, those, are, those are great places. And there is a question to be asked as to where do you start? Um, should you start with uh, your own site and then syndicate out, or should you start on other sites and then pull into your site from time to time? And there's, there's no clear answer for that. Most people prefer the publish first on your own and then syndicate it outward. But there are models in which the reverse model uh, may also work. But that's up to you. But I strongly encourage you, take a look at that bottom row and make sure you're doing those things. And then as your marketing budget and as your um, capabilities increase, you can start looking above that. Um, I'm going to give a couple of other examples of uh, what's happening right now in the, in the world of convergence. First of all, um, how many people get the Boston Globe still? Anybody here? Anybody local? One person, okay. Well, the Boston Globe still does have a fairly serious um, print uh, distribution. Um, however, anybody who's in the Boston area may have noticed that they've had some problems with it lately. And so what happened? Well, actually, interestingly enough, uh, a, a huge number of reporters and editors chipped in to help get these newspapers to people's homes. So suddenly you've got the editorial side of the house helping out the publishing side of the house. Now, you know, okay, that probably, that might have happened years ago, but the likelihood of things like that happening are much higher now because these walls between paid and, and earned are, are coming down so fast. So here we have reporters on the editorial side helping the publishing team, earned helping paid, uh, and, and earned and paid are converging in other ways. So writers, for example, are now more commonly than ever being compensated on the performance of the stories that they write. How many clicks am I generating? How much traffic is my article creating? And reporters may actually turn down your story because it, they can't figure out a way to get clicks and to drive traffic to their site. And this is, by the way, why you get the you won't believe kind of headlines that are out there. Um, because people respond to those and they react to them. It's not just the media and the strategies that are converging alongside the media. Uh, the very channels that we're using to reach our communities are converging as well. So as technology allows us to share data across very, very disparate marketing channels, um, from the in-store experience, the online experience, the print experience, the phone experience, etc., a single increasingly accurate picture of the customer is starting to emerge. It's starting to be painted. And we don't need to rely on demographic data anymore to make critical decisions, as, as Kenny mentioned. Uh, we now have a picture of each individual customer. The data are driving the evolution of marketing strategy now. So we've touched on a few things that are converging, but wait, there's more. Uh, we have the technologies, the strategies, the media categories, the channels, 
the customer experience and the brand experience, and even the specific social media platforms that are out there right now are starting to talk to one another and we're starting to see a lot more integration across those. So where is this convergence uh, headed? Well, it's heading toward, um, at least right now, this idea of a digital marketing hub. This is a new term, it's coined by Gartner, and it's destined to be replaced by the next big thing in all caps. Um, but essentially, it's a combination of, say, content management platforms, like WordPress as an example, CRM, marketing automation, some omni-channel support, uh, and then a consumer-centric approach to marketing. So you've got this idea called a marketing hub, and, and here's how it works. You start with your hub. This is your central platform. It is at your heart your content management system or your marketing automation platform or your CRM. Um, it is, generally speaking, you know, something that you want to ultimately drive people toward. Okay. Now, in the world of the big digital marketing solutions, this is actually you know, a kind of separate entity. Um, but what I'm going to do is show you a way to kind of piece together this concept using existing technologies. So think of this hub right now as your CRM, as your website, basically. So around this website, you're trying to find ways to interact with your publics, with your consumers. So you having a lot of engagement that hap that's happening outside the sphere of, of influence, the area in which you have full control over, right? This is what, what we would call in the media world your owned content. You kind of typically own this platform. Everything that gets published here is yours. You control it, et cetera. When you look outside of this, there's things like Facebook. Well, Facebook, you, you don't control Facebook. You can control the content that gets posted to Facebook, but you don't have full control over the user experience that's there. But it's certainly a platform that you want to interact with. Then you have other social media platforms like Twitter and, and all the other social channels that are out there. And then of course you have uh, web and mobile and tablet, the interfaces themselves. People coming into your website using those platforms. Then you have your email marketing system that you want to interact with. And finally, of course, you might have some face-to-face -face interaction or at least some phone interaction. So you've got to start figuring out ways to tie all these things together. Well, the idea behind the social marketing or with the digital marketing hub is that using all of these channels, you're creating, and I'll illustrate this in the measurement section, you're creating a, a, a series of steps, what we would call the conversion model, right, where you're slowly converting people or moving people toward that central platform where you have the most control. So that's pretty much it. That's, that's your digital marketing hub in a, in a nutshell. To integrate some of these other platforms together, you might use things like Hootsuite or TweetDeck and then work in some Google Analytics and some link shorteners to start kind of connecting these things all together. Plus, if you've got some tech people on your team, take advantage of some of the APIs that exist across these platforms. Um, to work with it. You also have other cool tools that are out there, things like If This Then That, um, which if you haven't played with, um, are a great substitute for much more fancy marketing automation systems that a lot of times are going to be a little bit unaffordable, especially for early stage startups. But if you can supplement that or make up for it with something like If This Then That, how many people have used If This Then That? Check it out, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really great for, for your social presence and for all the other presences that are out there. Um, Buffer is another tool that I use, the Buffer app. It makes me look like I'm much more engaged throughout the day than I actually am. I typically will go in in the morning, do a little bit of reading of articles, and then I'll throw those into the Buffer queue, and Buffer will push them out across the various social platforms um, one by one. So those are just a few things there. And then around that marketing hub, you build your channels, you build your sales and marketing process around this content, and you drive people around and then into this. Now this might be really, really scary. Um, don't panic. There are really simple ways in which you can implement this, this big old system. Um, and to get to those, I want to start talking about measurement a little bit. And this is the other uh, myth that Chuck mentioned that I wanted to pick up about. And that's about Google Analytics. Um, how many people are actively using Google Analytics to, to measure the effectiveness of their website? Okay, I'm, by the way, I'm not knocking Google Analytics. Google Analytics is very, very powerful. It's just not the only thing that needs to be in your arsenal. Before you dive in and go head over heels over all of the ability to measure traffic, how much 
you know, your, your, um, your, how much traffic has grown on your website over the, over the past year, or how many new Twitter followers that you have, you really need to start thinking about what your ultimate business goal is. What are you ultimately driving people toward? Right? Again, if we're talking, looking back at that digital marketing hub, your goal is to, at least at a high level, to drive people into areas of the world, the online world, that you control. But once they're there, what happens next? What is that last kind of conversion goal? So here's an example of how I try to break down measurement a little bit for my clients. If you look, there's kind of two broad categories of, of um, measurement options for us. On the left, we've got engagement, and this is our kind of engagement area, and this is what people talk about when they talk about, you know, getting people to retweet you, um, uh, for example. So retweets are an example of what I call amplification. Get people to like your content, that's an applause rate. Um, get people to engage with your content, in other words, to um, not just to retweet it, but to uh, tweet with a comment, okay, or tweet with a quote, um, or even reply with the content. Right? Those are all examples of engagement. The final kind of level of engagement is some form of activation, where they actually kind of click. So you might have kind of an interim activation, which is something like maybe clicking through to a slide share, where it's not your website yet, but it's a step toward your website, where you have a little more control over the visual experience. So in SlideShare, for example, um, I would, I've uploaded this deck to SlideShare, so when you look at it, you're getting a slightly more branded experience than what you might get on Twitter because you're going through our own slide deck. But the big activation is over here, right? And then there are various categories of activation that you can look at when you're measuring. So you can measure bounce, you know, how many people are getting to your site but not doing anything, that's bounce. How many people are getting to your site but only interacting with it a little bit. Maybe they clicked the read more on the site and then stopped, right? Not quite a bounce in Google Analytics terms. I would call that low activation. Then you might have medium activation, which is, well, maybe they share something, either on Twitter, LinkedIn, or via email. This, by the way, is email sharing is a big problem for a lot of people because it's what we call the dark web. It's things that are happening that we don't have direct measurement over, and there's a lot of stuff that's happening in the dark web that, um, that marketers would love to capture a little bit more. Then you might have higher activation, for example, uh, clicking a download link to download something that you might have available on your website. And then finally, you might actually have someone who becomes a lead. Maybe they opt into your newsletter. Um, okay, they sign up to um, uh, activate things. They, they activate your application. So they download your application, and then they sign in and create an account, and now they're actively interacting with your, with your content. These are all different ways in which you can measure interaction and drive people toward a conversion, an ultimate conversion, which is, in this case, probably not opt-in, it's probably pass that, which is, you know, buying something, right? Um, that's the ultimate conversion goal that anybody has, is, is the, the purchase itself. So we're talking about different ways to, to measure content, and I want to identify um, a couple of different approaches to, um, to, to measuring the effectiveness of your content. Um, web analytics, something like Google Analytics, is, is really, really essential. So for example, when it comes to your content, um, you might go into behavior, site content, all pages inside Google Analytics, and look at the articles that are performing really, really well, right? Which blog posts are performing well, which aren't? Uh, that's great. That doesn't answer all the questions that you might have. Um, you might want to do some measurement outside of the hub, and that's to do that, you're either going to have to buy some platforms, um, or you're going to have to use the native social media, media uh, analytics that come with these different tools. Twitter, for example, has um, a lot of analytics that are available to you now. Um, Facebook has a, a great analytics platform as well. LinkedIn, not so great, unfortunately. The analytics in LinkedIn are, are kind of lousy. Um, and the, 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 the real downside of all of these native analytics platforms is they're all using different definitions of common terms and a, 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 a click is not quite a click and there's different kinds of clicks, there's different kinds of uh, definitions of what engagement actually is across these platforms. So when you start really kind of looking at all of these and trying to merge all these together, 
you have to, um, to use a, a term MIT people will appreciate, you have to normalize the data, right? Uh, you really have to look at that and figure out some common definitions across all of this. Um, so you have to use that stuff, but even better is a combination that allows you to track the effectiveness of your engagement outside the hub, and this is through basically campaign codes. Um, has anybody used campaign codes before in Google, Google Analytics? Okay, a few people are using it. It's great. It's free if you use Google Analytics, which is also free, um, and very, very useful. So what you could do is, let's say you have a marketing campaign and you want to determine the effectiveness of one particular um, uh, effort. Maybe you want to determine the effectiveness of the slide share that you put together. Well, you could have in that slide share a click here for more information link, right? That could be kind of the last page in your slide share. And in there is a, uh, an encoded link. It could be bitly encoded, for example. And when you break that little bitly encoded link out, it actually includes this campaign code. So if you go and Google uh, Google URL Builder or Google Campaign Codes, it will bring you to a page that looks like this, and it asks a few basic questions. It asks you to name your campaign, to name the channel that you're using. So all of a sudden, you have these parameters. I'm going to get. I'm going to geek out a little bit. You get these parameters that are passed to Google Analytics that say, "This was a link clicked on from Twitter with this campaign." So you, you know, it's it's our awareness campaign number one, and a click came from Twitter. And then in Google Analytics, you can measure the effectiveness of each of your campaigns. How many people here are familiar with HubSpot? Okay, a few HubSpot people, great little Cambridge company right around the corner from us. Uh, at least they used to be. They're in Boston now or something? They move out, they're still in Cambridge? Okay, good. Um, their CEO gives a great presentation about what he makes his uh, CMO give to him. Now, his CMO is no longer there, long story. Um, but it was a great presentation, and it outlined this funnel, like a traditional sales funnel, only e inside the funnel were these lines that were each of the campaigns, and you could see how far down the sales funnel each campaign drove people. How much closer to that ultimate conversion, or conversion did each campaign work? So you could see that actually, wow, SlideShare is getting us a lot of traffic, and a lot of uh, click-throughs, and we're getting a lot of opt-ins from SlideShare. So that content's compelling. That campaign is working really, really well. Twitter, not so much. So you can make those evaluations um, inside Google Analytics. So it's a great little trick and a great tactic for you to measure the effectiveness of your, of your content. Now, along with asking about the effectiveness of your marketing campaigns, you may be tempted here and there to measure uh, things like ROI. Um, and be able to present that. Um, just remember that ROI is one of many, many different metrics. There's a whole bunch of metrics that are out there. There's a whole bunch of different categories of metrics that are out there. It's, uh, ROI is a measurement of valuation. Oops. Um, but valuation is not the only thing that you want to measure. You want to measure things like what you're producing, your outputs, um, how you're changing minds, which is your outtakes, um, how you're changing behaviors, which is outcomes. Um, and if you're an agency like us, you also want to be able to hold your client's feet to the fire and say, well, you only gave us so much to work with. That's inputs into the system. So now you have kind of a full measurement package that includes all of these, and you really need to make sure you're touching on, if not all of these, at least um, you know, the ones that are going to help you justify your existence down the road. And that's ultimately our goal, is to justify our existence. So I'm going to close before I hand it back to... Uh, Kevin, with a wrap-up of our session, on uh, two ways in which you can think about your marketing campaigns and think about your marketing goals. And generally speaking, marketers fall into one of two categories, and marketing tactics fall into one of two categories. You're either out there trying to generate awareness, general awareness, to support some kind of marketing effort elsewhere, uh, or to support a sales effort, um, or your particular campaign is focused on a lead, lead generation, where it's more directly sales relevant. And that's one of the first questions you need to ask yourself when you start marketing your application, is what kind of marketing do I want to do? Am I building a lead generation campaign, or am I building an awareness campaign? 
Public relations is great for awareness. Not so good for lead gen. Um, it was fascinating. We had, I had a client that got coverage in, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, in USA Today, and in TechCrunch, and my client, which, which, <laughs> which of these three platforms do you think my client was most excited about? The Wall Street Journal. Why do you say that? Because it's the, right, it's the article that you want to see posted on your wall when, you know, on your ego wall in your company. Why, my client was excited about TechCrunch. Why? Because it had the URL in it. And people were clicking through on the URL and it was generating traffic to the website. So we got all excited about the journal hit and my client was all excited about TechCrunch because it was generating traffic to the website. My client was thinking this was a lead gen campaign, I was thinking this was an awareness campaign and we had a disconnect. So make sure you don't have those kinds of disconnects and I'll, I'll close it with that. And hand it to Kevin. Well, hold on to the mic, I think. Okay. So oh, we're, yeah, yours. We're, yeah, we're currently standing in between you and a tasty sandwich from Panera mm. Bread. Um, rather than read through the takeaways, because we'll have this and we'll be able to provide it to you, now's probably a good opportunity to, to open it up for questions uh, for myself, Todd, or Chuck, unless I miss something. That's perfect. We'll take questions for these guys. While that's going on, again, I'm going to pass out the feedback forms. We really appreciate you writing down just something you appreciated about the presentation, any other thoughts, and, if you'd like a chance to get a complimentary 30-minute consultation with these guys, just check the box at the bottom, leave your name and email. And one more thing, we have a bit.ly link that you can follow, which we'll track, um, that lets you download or go to the SlideShare version of, of this slide deck as well. So it's uh, bit.ly slash ab hyphen ema hyphen mit. Yeah, uh, typically, not, not really. Um, I, what I would argue is that maybe B2C is slightly more likely to fall into the awareness category than the lead generation category, but that's not necessarily 100% true. Yeah, and I think that's changed over time. The walls in B2B, B2B used to be you have to go through gatekeepers to reach your decision makers, whether a design engineer or uh, someone specking a product on a piece of hardware. Today, that, that per same person is at Dick's Sporting Goods with his son on a Saturday buying sneakers, and you can reach them with a, key, with a message. So. Uh, it behaves a lot like consumer nowadays. The, the one place you do get into a little bit more difference is way down in the weeds when you get to the tactical level. Um, you know, for example, in media relations, some of the stuff about, uh, you know, I, and, and I, I neglected to talk about this a little bit, but when you're focusing on how do you, finding somebody who doesn't whisper in the ears, the only exception to that rule is if you want to be on the TV talk shows in the morning. Those people are really well connected. But outside of that, you know, it's, it, that's where they, those tacticals, tactics begin to play a role but not in a broad sense. I think you had your hand up first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> in certain industries. It's not about certain industries, it's where you are in your life cycle, your company, and what you need. Um, and, and also what you need in your marketing mix at that moment. So it's, I don't like to think about them as either ors, but you know, yes and, uh, because you need both of those. You need those articles in order to be able to drive some level of interest at certain points in your, in your life cycle. TechCrunch speaks to investors. You know, New York Times speaks to something else. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's what I would add is, you know, for example, interacting with VCs, they want to see those articles. Sure. Follow up? Hmm? So we, we, we tried to hone this presentation for that. So, you know, if you, if you go back to, you know, this stuff here, um, everything here is free. Basically, you, you can do all of these different tools for free. Um, I would say with the marketing hub, um, with, with this approach, almost everything in here can be done for free. You can use Buffer for free. It's kind of a freemium model. Hootsuite and TweetDeck. TweetDeck is, is more free than Hootsuite. Um, but Google Analytics link shorteners, almost everything here is at least at the highest level free. Now, that doesn't necessarily um, scale, right? So... We got a question up here, okay, and then actually, we'll I want, go I want here. To, I want to add one more thing, and then go yeah. to that very quickly. the The only the place that I would try to look at, and something Todd and I did when we we had started a company called Fresh Ground that was aimed at 
early stage startups originally. And the way that we viewed this world was, um, you know the old uh, mixers when you used to mix audio, and you bring that pot, one, one thing up, another thing down, and each time you're gonna have to kind of adjust a little bit. So if you're announcing funding, maybe that's a media relations campaign, then you pull it back down, you focus on content next. So it's really trying to balance those resources over time and looking at the timeline as your equalizer. So, yes? Uh, how much you got? <laughs> no, um, that typically the <laughs> right. I mean, honestly, that's typically the response that you'll get to that. Or you know, so if you want to engage a full-fledged public relations agency, um, you know, typically in a hotter market, you know, the the floor for that might be you know ten thousand dollars a month for a PR agency. Now, yeah, even fifteen to twenty for some of the larger agencies. So. Um, you have to think about who you want to engage with, number one, who those audiences are that you're trying to, who are the publics, basically, in the public relations term, and who has the most influence there. So bringing to bear all the guns of a, of a huge agency might not be the most practical thing for your spend. Um, it, it might keep the VCs happy. Once you've got a round of funding, the VCs might encourage you to do something like that. But for a startup, just fresh out of the gate, especially if you're bootstrapped, that's not an option. Um, so what's, what's interesting is that in the old days, as PR people, um, we would turn down uh, what, what would be described as a pay-per-play opportunity, uh, hands down, which is, uh, we'll pay you if you get coverage here, 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 and here. Um, that still doesn't really work that well. But what's interesting is that because things are more measurable now, there's more opportunities to work with, say, individual contractors who, who might be able to do that. So that's an option as well, where you find some individual um, marketers who have the uh, relationships in the market, in the public that you want to reach, and interact with them and, and share different options, you know, explore different ways in which you can compensate, whether it's giving them a cut of the business, to um, some kind of conditional funding, um, to you know, very very you know, small amounts and 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 startups. So there's a lot of options to work with smaller people that way. There are also bigger agencies who will say to your face, "Well, we don't do anything under twenty thousand, but also might have a startup package that they're willing to give. And while you may not get the individual attention that you would as a bigger client. Um, you are getting uh, the experience of some of the senior people who have kind of packaged everything up. Um, so they'll give you a press release. They'll give you, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 hours of media relations promoting the, the launch press release and some other things that might be part of that package. So that's another option as well. Um, when thinking about the buy, though, what I would try to do is on, if you're looking at branding and design and, brand and development and message development, that can often be a package of an early, you know, piece if you're looking at a long-term PR program, think in terms of six months to a year in order to see any kind of effectiveness. Uh, I've had a lot of clients come in and say, look, I'll, I can, I'll pay you for like three months and we'll see how it goes and maybe I'll drop more money into it. That never works, it never works for anybody because there's so many other factors that can get in your way in that timeline. You really need to look at extended timelines. So if you're developing a budget, you have to think about what you have for six months to a year, not just for three months. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Where do you go fishing to find PR people? Uh, I, I, in all honesty, and I, and I hate to say this because it's, it's backfired on me, um, the investors that you're working with sometimes have people that they know. There are, uh, PRSA actually has a board. You can usually find things there. There was a company, I think they're still around, called Air PR, and they were trying to connect people. Uh, and, there, and there are a bunch of... of um, uh, recruiters in the Boston area who do deal with freelancers. And there's a, a few other, it, sometimes if you just post on LinkedIn, does everybody know a good PR person? That stuff flows right yeah. back at you. Uh, and there's, I know if you have a VP of marketing, there's a, um, for local VPs of marketing in the Boston area, there is a Yahoo group called Any Excuse. And I sometimes see stuff come through there uh, from, from different people, so. Go ahead. Yeah, so are there some, what's your advice on that? Um, they're usually, uh, we look for those inflection points, right? We're ready to launch a product. We have, uh, usually it's after they've hired a VP of marketing, right? They, they've already made that decision. You have a founder, now you have a VP of marketing. You thought about the marketing function a little bit more deeply. Um, the A round is another point to do it, not at the angel level, but at the A round. 
uh, is that point to start to engage and look outside for PR. For branding and development, that's a little different because it can often be purchased as a, as a, as a package for early, early on. Uh, and sometimes that's got to take place early. Um, and maybe when you have that angel money, putting some of it aside for that kind of work. Uh, but it, that, I've always seen the trigger in that is that VP of marketing hire is when a company has finally said, now this is important enough to have a department, to have some people devoted to it. We need outside vendors. And most VPs of marketing I know work with a lot of outside vendors. They'll have an SEO firm, they'll have a, a social firm, they'll have a, a, you know, a, you know, a, um, a PR firm and so on. I don't know if you have a... Yeah, uh, well, I think, I think Chuck really covered it. I, I, inbound, I take all the inbound inquiries that come into the agency. And we're at a stage now where... Um, and we've gone through the stage where we would take any warm body willing to pay us anything, you know, uh, and help them. And, and uh, what we've found on the PR side is really that at a certain level at like $7,000 a month, we can do really activate a lot of good stuff. And we start to sink below that, it becomes more challenging. From a branding and creative perception, if someone's come to us and like, I really need help to elevate, I often ask, you know, well, how long have you been doing this? You know, what kind of customers do you have? And do you have someone who understands what we do as designers and, and marketers in-house in that we'll be able to work with? And if the answer is no, it's often really challenging for us because we're, we're investing so much time educating someone, maybe a brilliant CEO who's founded the company but doesn't understand what we do. Um, and that's a key inflection point, and I often will hand those opportunities off to a freelancer, uh, someone who's more about very tactical, uh, I know what I need, and they're gonna come in and they're gonna help you and it's gonna be economical and really right for your business. Um, so, and there's, and there's everything in between. Uh, so I'll be very quickly, speaking to Todd's inputs piece before, that person who's inside thinking about the marketing is the one that's gonna be feeding us what we need to make a successful program. Without that driver, the program's gonna be a hard thing to be successful anyway. And let's, take, let's take one last audience question, and then these guys will also be available afterwards for more questions. Thank you. Um, given that some of the entrepreneurs in the audience here may not have the seven to ten thousand dollars a month yet, what would be the three to end things you would suggest that he or she do on his or her own to kind of get that communication goal or that PR goal? I, I think you know. Engaging in the local community um, is really, really important. So, for example, find the top three influential reporters uh, that might be local to you. Find their Twitter feeds, read their Twitter feeds, see what events they're going to, um, see what they're writing about on their Twitter feed, see what they're um, writing about, of course, in their uh, actual columns or um, articles. And give yourself some opportunity to get some exposure and to learn a little bit from that. That's really the, the, the start of it is kind of, basically I would say start listening, right? Identify who your influencers are, um, who the influencers are for the, for the media that, or for the community that you're trying to read, uh, reach, and then listen to them. Start a listening program. You can set up Google Alerts, for example. Um, anytime there's a mention of, you know, we talk about Scott Kirstner all the time in the Boston tech community. So set up a, a Google Alerts on Scott Kirstner when anytime he writes a new post, you can, you can see what he's thinking about. Um, and find other opportunities like that. I ju I'd just add real quick, Chuck, because I think Kenny's presentation is, is really spot on. Like even before yeah. doing that, is you really gotta design what your, what's your story, right? And make sure you, you nail the value proposition so that when you go and you start to share your, you know, your story with people you know, with, through LinkedIn, through reporters, that you've got that locked down. I was looking to talk about the story as well, but even more uh, tactically, if you think about the broader story of what your company is and then an individual story, take that and go to meetups and talk to people and just get that individual feedback to see where they're going. Speak at meetups, they're very easy to speak at, right? You call up the guy who's creating it, say I have a presentation, you go and do it. Um, and then you're gonna get that individual feedback, that becomes a blog post, that becomes a LinkedIn post. You start to cycle these things through, take that feedback and develop that community through that way where you're giving back and bringing your pieces out and listening back. And as that grows, you'll begin to see those channels that you can start to flow through. Thanks very much everybody. Thank you.